Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome to my channel. If you haven't done so already, please be sure to press that like and subscribe button below. Um, on this video, I'll be covering Bible signs, so let's just jump right into it. First question. A six-year-old boy is just eating a, has just eaten a great popsicle and the nurse is ready to take vital signs. An appropriate action would be to one, take the rectal temperature, two, take the oral temperature as planned, three, have the child rinse out the mouth with warm water, or four, wait 20 minutes before assessing the oral temperature. And the correct answer is four. Because the child just had a popsicle, which is cold, you wanna give it 20 to 30 minutes before you check the child's oral temperature. Now this goes for any food or drinks. If a food or drink was ingested, you wanna wait 20 to 30 minutes before you take the oral temperature, okay? That's giving the body enough time to go back to its normal temp. So your assessment will be accurate. Next question. The client is seen in the emergency center for heat exhaustion as a result of exposure. The nurse anticipates that treatment will include one, replacement of fluid electrolytes, two, initiation of oral antibiotic therapy, three, application of hypothermia wrap, and four, alcohol sponge baths. The correct answer is one, replacement of fluid and electrolytes. So anybody who's had um, heat exhaustion, heat exposure, they've been out in the sun, they're losing a lot of what? Fluid and electrolytes. They get dehydrated, right? They're sweating a lot. What comes out of the sweat? Sodium, okay? Patients losing fluid and electrolytes, they're sweating, they're heaving. <sighs> Guess what? All of those breaths that that patient takes, they're losing fluids as well. So you want that patient to be rehydrated. So you're going to replace the fluid and electrolytes that that patient loses. Let's look at our other choices. B was initiation of oral antibiotic therapy. You give antibiotics when a patient has a bacterial infection. That has nothing to do with heat exhaustion. So you would not have chosen that answer. Three, application of hypothermia blankets. Well, uh, hypothermia blankets, that cools you off, but that's not going to be a priority for this patient. The priority is fluid and electrolytes that needs to be replaced. And of course, four is incorrect where it says alcohol sponge baths. Guess what that does? That may cool the patient off, but that also causes shivering. We don't give alcohol sponge baths anymore, okay, because it causes shivering. So the correct answer is one, replacement of fluid and electrolytes. Please, um... If you guys have an issue with priorities, make sure you watch my priority video because I go in depth about which patients are a priority and what situations are a priority. Fluid electrolytes definitely is a priority. It falls under physiologic integrity and fluid electrolytes, that's one of those things that will either keep a patient alive or kill them. And that's why uh, fluid electrolytes is so important and it's considered a priority. The client appears to be breathing faster than before. The nurse should, one, ask the client if he has felt stressful, two, have the client lay down on the bed, three, count the client's rate of respirations, four, palpate the client's own radial pulse. And the correct answer is three, if the patient appears to be breathing faster than normal, your first step is to assess, add pi assess you're going to assess you're going to actually count the respirations now here's the thing about counting respirations you can never let a patient know you're counting their respirations because even if it's subconsciously they'll either start increasing their breathing or slowing down without even doing it on purpose so you never want to let a patient know when you're counting their respirations so what you do is you pretend like you're taking their pulse and you take their finger you take their arm put it over their chest right and you pretend like you're counting their pulse, but you're really watching the rise and fall of their chest. And you're not letting them know that you're counting respirations just so that you guys can get the true number, okay? So the correct answer is count. If you suspect that the respirations are abnormal, the first thing you always wanna do in that situation is assess. Moving on to our next question. A nurse administers pain medication for a client complaining of pain. The nurse first assesses vital signs and finds them to be as follows. Blood pressure 134 over 92, 
pulse 90, respiration is 26, breath per minute. The nurse's most appropriate action is to one, give the medication, two, ask the client if they're anxious, three, check the client's dressing for bleeding, four, recheck the client's vital signs in 30 minutes. And the correct answer is one, give the medication in the body of the question. It says that the patient is in pain. They're complaining of pain and that's consistent with the vital signs. When the patient's in pain, what do you see happen? Blood pressure is elevated, okay? Breathing elevated, heart rate may be elevated. The patient said they're in pain. You have the order for it. You're gonna give the medication. Look at number two, ask them if they're anxious. There's no reason to ask them if they're anxious. In the body, they tell you what the problem is. The patient is in pain and the vital signs um, collab, um, correlate with that patient's pain. Look at three, check the client's dressing for bleeding. Let me tell you why that's incorrect. If a patient's bleeding, let me tell you what their vital signs are gonna be. You're gonna see the heart rate go up but you're gonna see the blood pressure go down. And that is not the case in this situation. So we're gonna get rid of that. And of course, number four is wrong. Check the vitals in 30 minutes. You never do that. When you see something abnormal, you're going to assess and then your next action is to implement. You never just do nothing and come back and check later, okay? So in this situation, you're going to give the medication. That's what's appropriate. Moving on to the next question. A client has just gotten out of bed to go to the bathroom. As the nurse enters the room, the client says, I feel dizzy. The nurse should, one, go for help, two, take the client's blood pressure, three, assist the client to a sitting position, four, tell the client to take several deep breaths. And the correct answer is three, assist the client to a sitting position, okay? There's something that's called orthostatic hypotension. And what happens is if the patient's been lying down for a long time and then they all of a sudden come uh, stand up, what happens is that blood pressure drops. It plummets very quickly and that's what causes the dizziness and that puts the patient at high risk for a fall, which you wanna avoid. So safety is the priority. So. The very first thing you're gonna do in this situation is ease them back to a sitting position, okay? You're not gonna have them stand up because like I said, they're a fall risk. Look at number one, go for help. So you mean to tell me that patient just stood up and they said, oh, I'm feeling dizzy and you're gonna turn your back on that patient to go get help? No, absolutely not. You're gonna stay with that patient because safety is a priority. And like I said, you're gonna ease them back to their seat. So you're not gonna do one. Number two, take the client's blood pressure. So let me get this right. A patient who's been lying down, they get up, they say they're feeling dizzy. You're gonna take their blood pressure while they're standing up. And guess what? They might fall to the ground and hurt themselves. The first thing you wanna do is ease them to a safe position. And number four, tell the client to take several deep breaths. That's not gonna help that patient who's about to pass out or fall. So a client who's experiencing or they're exhibiting signs and symptoms of what's known as high, um, orthostatic hypotension, the first thing you're going to do is ease them to a sitting position. You want them safe. You do not want them standing up at all. False high blood pressure reading may be assessed. As the nurse explains to the nurse assistant, if the assistant, one, wraps the cuff, two, tightly around the arm, Two, deflate, deflates the blood pressure cuff too quickly. Three, repeats the blood pressure assessment too soon. Or four, presses the stethoscope too firmly in the anticubital fossa. And the correct answer is one, wraps the cuff too tightly around the arm. So here's the thing guys, the blood pressure cuff has to fit snugly not tightly, not loosely, but snugly. Here's why. If the blood pressure cuff is too tight, you're gonna get a false high reading. If the blood pressure cuff is too loose, you're gonna get a false low reading, okay? That's very important. This concept is seen on HESI, NCLEX, ATI, you name it, so you gotta understand that concept, okay? If the cuff is too tight, the reading will be falsely high, and if the cuff is too loose, the reading will be falsely low, okay? 
Let's look at our other choices. Deflating the blood pressure cuff too quickly. When you deflate the blood pressure cuff too quickly, you're gonna get an inaccurate reading. And what that means is that the blood pressure may have been higher, but you deflated it too quickly and you couldn't hear the click. And so um, whenever you deflate too quickly, you might get um, an abnormally low reading because you didn't wait. Choice number three, repeating the blood pressure assessment too soon. Um, when you take that blood pressure too soon, you're more likely going to get that uh, same reading. It's not gonna be too high or too low. You just not, you just probably will not uh, see that change. And then of course you have four, presses the stethoscope too firmly in the antecubital fossa. When you do that guys, you may obliterate that pulse and you may not be able to hear it, okay? So for number 16, the correct answer is one, wrap the cuff too tightly around the arm. That will cause a falsely high reading. Our next question, the client is febrile and the temperature needs to be reduced. The nurse anticipates that treatment will include one, an alcohol and water bath, two, ice packs to the axilla and groin, three, tepid plain water sponge down, or four, application of a cooling blanket. And the correct answer is four, application of a cooling blanket. Um, we don't do the, the sponge baths or the alcohol baths anymore. And the reason for that is it causes shivering. Why don't, want, why don't we want shivering? Well, shivering increases the body's metabolic demands, which increases the fever. And the fever is what we're trying to get rid of. So it kind of defeats the purpose. So that's why when we're trying to cool a patient off, we put give them cooling blankets because cooling blankets, we're cooling them off, but we're not making them shiver where these other choices would uh, cause the patient to shiver, which would actually make their condition worse. While the nurse is taking the client's blood pressure, the client asks if the reading is high. In accordance with the newest guidelines, the nurse informs the client that a blood pressure measurement that is consistent with hypertension is one, 120 over 70, two, 130 over 84, three, 120 over 78, four, 118 over 80. And the correct answer is two, 130 over 84. So guys, depending on which textbook you're using, you know, I might be off by about five uh, points, but your normal blood pressure range is 90 over 60 to 140 over 90, okay? However, once you hit that 120 to 139 range, you know, that's considered pre-hypertension. So out of this list, your number two would be your choice, okay? The client's being monitored with pulse oximetry. On review of the following factors, the nurse suspects that the values will be influenced by one, the placement of the sensor on the extremity, two, a diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease, three, a reduced amount of artificial light in the room, four, increased ambient temperature of the client's room. And the correct answer is to a diagnosis of peripheral vascular disease. So here's how the pulse ox works, guys. So you put the pulse ox on the patient's extremity. It could be on the finger or earlobe, right? And so what the pulse ox measures is how much oxygen is being delivered in the blood. Because remember that blood, that's what is delivering oxygen to all of your vital nutrients, nutrients of your vital organs, okay? So if a patient has uh, peripheral vascular disease, that means they don't have good circulation in their periphery, such as the fingers or the earlobe where you're actually placing the pulse ox reading. So if they're not having good circulation, you're not really gonna be able to pick up on that oxygen that's supposed to be carried in the blood, which is what's being measured. So that's why number two is the answer. Any patient with peripheral vascular disease, that is going to influence the recording of the pulse ox, okay? Next question. An individual contacts the ER of the local hospital to ask what to do for a skiing partner who appears to be suffering from hypothermia. The victim's alert and is able to respond to questions. 
The nurse instructs the individual who has called to have the victim, one, take sips of brandy, two, drink a bowl of warm soup, three, drink a cup of very hot coffee, four, run the affected extremities under hot water. And the correct answers too, guys, you're gonna have them uh, drink a bowl of warm soup. So I wanna go over these other choices. Number one, never in my history of teaching nursing, and I've, I've been doing this for a very long time, guys, about 15 years. I've never seen an answer choice where we give alcohol to the patient. We encourage them to drink alcohol. That's what we tell the patient to do, give somebody alcohol. No, okay? So as a student, you should have gotten rid of that, okay? We're not going to tell, and tell, tell anyone to drink a brandy. So we're getting rid of number one. That leaves us with number two, three, and four. Number three, drink a cup of, here's the key, guys. It doesn't even say hot. It says very hot. Very hot anything you should have gotten rid of because what? That places the patients at, um, puts them in danger of doing what? Getting burned, right? They can burn their tongue. So the fact that it said hot, that should have been an issue, but it says very hot. You know, it didn't say warm. It said very hot. So you should have gotten rid of that, right? But not only does it say very hot, it says coffee. Coffee's what? Constricting, okay? It has caffeine, so we have better choice than that. We're gonna get rid of that. And then the number four, run the affect extremities under hot water. Like I said, guys, we don't want any extremities in temperature, okay? Not hot, we don't want that. We want warm because hot can do what? It can burn a patient. So the correct answer is to drink a bowl of warm soup. It's warm, it'll warm up their body, but not burn them, okay? When we see that word hot, we're thinking of burns and we don't want our patient to be burned. So the correct answer is number two. A spouse assists a nurse evaluating the measurement of the client's blood pressure. The nurse feels additional teaching is required if the spouse is observed. One, deflating the cuff at two mm's. Two, having the client sit down for the measurement. Three, using the same time each day for the measurement. Or four, taking the blood pressure after the client comes from a walk. And the correct answer is four. All of the other choices are wonderful. We wanna do that. The wrong answer is four. Taking the blood pressure after the client comes from a walk. You ne never wanna take the client's blood pressure right after um, they were exercising or right after they were eating or right after um, uh, they were drinking. And let me be specific with that. When I say eating or drinking, I'm speaking more specifically to temperature, but for blood pressure after patients exercise, you want to wait 30 minutes because that gives them a chance for their body to wind down and for you to get a true uh, accurate measurement of what that patient's blood pressure was. So when you're taking an oral temperature, you're going to wait 20 to 30 minutes after the patient ate or drank something. But if you're taking a blood pressure, you're going to wait about 30 minutes after the patient exercise for their body to kind of um, cool down and um, go back to the level that it was before you can take that blood pressure so it can be accurate. The nurse appropriately instructs trained ancillary personnel to avoid using an electric blood pressure cuff to take the blood pressure of which of the following clients. One, a 25 year old who was admitted for depression and anxiety. Two, a 69 year old diagnosed with Parkinson's disease five years ago. Three, a 57 year old prescribed antihypertensive medication six weeks ago. Or four, an 80 year old client whose systolic blood pressure is routinely assessed in the low 90s. And the correct answer is to a 69 year old diagnosed with Parkinson's disease five years ago. So here's what's going on guys. You never want to do use an electric uh, blood pressure cuff on any patient that um, has seizures, is trembling, um, their blood pressure uh, is lower, the systolic blood pressure is lower than 90. 
um, if they have tremors, okay, those type of pla patients, you have to um, you have to uh, physically take their blood pressure, not use. You have to manually take their blood pressure and not use an el electronic blood pressure cuff. Okay, so these are the patients that you have to manually take their blood pressure. Any patients that have tremors, any patients that have seizures, any patients that have um, um, shakes. Okay, any patients who their systolic blood pressure consistently has been below the 90s because the um, electronic machine may not pick it up, so you may need to do it manually. So that's why the correct answer is two, because that patient who has Parkinson's disease, what do they do? They shake, they have tremors like that. So that type of patient that has Parkinson's is shaking. Can you use an electronic blood pressure machine? No, for that type of patient, you have to take their blood pressure manually. The nurse is assessing an elderly client's blood pressure during a routine visit. When asked, the client volunteers that when he took his pressure at home yesterday, it was 126 over 72. The nurse determines that the client's pressure today is 134 over 70. The nurse recognizes that the most likely cause of the elevation is one, the difference between the monitoring equipment being used. Two, the client may be experiencing mild anxiety regarding the checkup. Three, the effects of aging on the client's ability to hear the first corticoff sound. Four, the client is not inflating the cuff sufficiently to detect systolic blood pressure. And the correct answer is two, the client may be experiencing mild anxiety regarding the checkup. Guys, this is what's known as a white coat syndrome. So the patient, when they're taking their own uh, vital signs or taking their blood pressure, everything's normal. But the minute they get to the doctor's office, all of a sudden it's elevated, right? That's known as the white coat syndrome. They are just nervous. It's anxiety about even being in a healthcare facility. And that's why that blood pressure is slightly elevated. Okay, guys, last question. The nurse has asked the assistive personnel to take the blood pressure of a client who experienced a left mastectomy three days ago. Which of the following statements by the assistive personnel shows the best understanding regarding the appropriate assessment technique for this particular client? One, is there anything affecting her right arm? Two, has she been experiencing any edema in the left arm? Three, how long has it been since she had her breast removed? Four, I'll wait until she's been medicated for pain before I take it. And guys, the correct answer is one. Is there anything affecting her right arm? Why? I want you to think about it. If that patient had a left-sided mastectomy, okay, and the assistive personnel is asking about the right arm, that shows that the assistive personnel understands because the patient had a left-sided mastectomy, they cannot get blood pressures on that same side. So she understands she has to get the blood pressure on the other side. That's why she's asking if the patient has anything going on with the other side because she's aware, he or she is aware that the patient who had a left-sided mastectomy cannot get blood pressure readings on the left arm. So that is the correct answer. Guys, I hope this video has been helpful for you guys to understand vital signs, what's expected of you, the assessment, the nursing interventions. And please, if you have not done so already, please like this video. Please be sure to subscribe to my channel to keep the questions, the quizzes, and the content coming. If you guys have any concepts that you want to see me do a video on or you want me to clarify, please be sure to leave a comment and I'll make sure that I make a video for you. Thank you for joining. See you next time.